Okay, so the other day, Yannick and I played around with OpenAI's Codex for the first time, and you can just see our visceral reaction to it. I mean, I was giggling like a schoolboy. It was genuinely very exciting and very entertaining. Um, my position hasn't changed since we did the GPT-3 video. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this is just exactly the same thing. Clearly, it's been trained on code, so it's slightly better at code. And even though you're sampling the language model with a temperature of zero, it sort of like reliably gives you decent code. I think it's very entertaining, but I can't really see myself using it as a as a kind of experienced software engineer. Would my mother want to use it to write some software? Maybe. I think the kind of software it creates is only the kind of software you would want to use in a throwaway context. I think it wouldn't help you write enterprise grade software. So yeah, um, I think it's quite fun, but not that useful. But um, we edited the video as well. So what you can't see from the video is that 90% of the time we were fixing errors. I've only showed you really the fun bits. And this is what I've noticed online on these Codex videos is that you only get to see it working. And there's a real selection bias there because I can promise you 90% of the time it's not working. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the video. See you soon. So we still got that JavaScript, Darren. We've got four now. Here. <laughs> Open developer console. Okay. Suddenly it doesn't seem as easy. Let's make a, um, a 12 by 12 grid. Make a 12 checker color, something like this. Nope. <laughs> We're now in full web dev debugging mode. <laughs> so this is the grid. See, so this is the grid. Oh, there's just nothing in it yet. Okay. Put a letter into each cell. <laughs> Make every other cell black. No way. I mean, that's... Almost. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> it starts at 65. <laughs> and it always correctly indexes into the grid, right? oh. even with the the coloric no this wow. is not it interprets as checkered yeah color the grid like a chess board <laughs> wow yes ah. amazing See? amazing See? crazy yeah so we want to have a character that can traverse the grid cells and it needs to look like a pokemon <laughs> and element to the first grid cell Picture of a Pokemon. <laughs> no way. That is incredible. <laughs> wow. When the user presses the arrow key, the, arrow key, the, the arrow Pokemon key, will go in the. The Pokemon will move on the grid. No way. I think that's gonna work. Oh wow! Whoa! Okay, no. no, it's just that it worked once, but okay, it worked once. With crazy, <laughs> crazy. See now I get I get errors. Okay. When I press arrow keys. Yeah, yeah. So what's it done then? So it said. Yeah, I guess it doesn't find the Pokemon again. But in any case, uh, it's pretty impressive. Pretty cool. Uh, every time the user presses. An arrow. The, the, the Pokemon travels to the adjacent cell in the grid. The grid. It would just refer to just the the Pokemon on the like. Yeah. So Whoa. now <laughs> it <laughs> doesn't exactly work, but you know. <laughs> wow. I'm going to guess it registers multiple events or something. The grid will still have loads of event listeners from before. Can you control With the it? Arrow keys, I can. Oh, yeah. Nice, nice. Um, say a when. Bit. <laughs> say when when the element intersects the walls, it turns blue. Oh no! I can actually not connect. Um, let the user control the element with the arrow. Now I can. Okay. I, I just controlled the scroll bars before. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, say uh, say it goes blue when out of bounds. 
No. Okay. Mouse out. It's a mouse out listener. Ah. Oh, interesting. Not what we wanted, but... No. Say as it travels, um, it accelerates or something. It goes faster. No. No? Mm. Mm. No, I don't think so. Mm. Oh, there's a mouse move now. Let's, let's kill that, because... Because, yeah. <laughs> Downloads the current stock data. And then uh, we have to go a bit longer, right? Mm -hmm. About 512. There's a plot. There's a main function. Yeah. So, I'm not sure. Can I run this? <laughs> So that's the Bitcoin price every second. No way. Mm -hmm. I, I would be uh, seriously yeah. impressed if it gets this. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let's see. Um, complete. Ah, uh, just makes more examples. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Is that what it did? I mean, it's, it, it's wrong, but it looks kind of interesting. Should I? I should I could try to to execute this. Um, no way. Yeah, I mean, it is completely wrong. It's adding the potions oh. to your health points. This is your example. 20 and 2. Solution 9. Solution 5. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, that is horrendously it, wrong. It tried. Interesting. Try the, the other one. Now, this one's a oh. little more interesting. No, it's still, still completely wrong. 5. No, wait, I didn't save. Uh, 3 and 12. Yeah, no, it's just... What, what does it do? laughably wrong it's supposed to be okay, I mean, looking at the first order differences well there's something here every price in prices take the minimum price and price no it's just meaningless maybe you have to formulate it i don't i don't know how to you have to formulate it well now we get into the loops yeah i was getting so excited about codex and now the uh, the reality is setting in <laughs> <laughs> if you yeah we're using it wrong yeah, yeah, your goal be. is to write the program. I think you need to write it as if it appears in code, right? Implements an algorithm that will find the two elements that are closest to each other in a list. Maybe not an index out of range. Okay, it doesn't work, but a good try. They could design a SQL table. I want to design a SQL table where there are products and customers. Now we can, you can go on, right? You can say implement a, sorry, a product data class with name, price, SQL table for the above. There is a product. There are the purchases wow. with foreign keys. Oh, yes, yeah. SQL insert statements. We're not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got some question marks. Every track, it could be in, I don't know, 128 languages. And it needs to be sparse. Let's say there's a translation for every language and you want it to be sparse. So it only records the translation for that particular language, not all of the languages. Which should be sparse. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> but here, look, it does, it does like... It does it even with the SQL alchemy, right? Wow. So now here's the locale. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what this... Uh, Track ID, locale. Then you have the language, but then you have all of this stuff. I'm not sure if that... I think that has done what I've asked though. So it's going to create okay. for a track, for a locale. It's yeah. going to create all of the title yeah. and everything. So it's done it. Okay. That's pretty cool. Well, it, it just... Whoa. In, it just imports all kinds of support vector machines. Yeah. Implement an SVM to predict whether the Bitcoin price will go up next week. Hey, oh. reading data. <laughs> DF cleaned. Drop, drop some columns. Random <laughs> seed 42. <laughs> Train test split. Scale the data. Create SVM model. Fit. Predict accuracy confusion. Well, it's just done like a standard, a standard SVM. Like and now, it has essentially nothing to do with the with the Bitcoin price, right? So you'd have to get that data somehow. 
Say John Carmack's fast inverse square root. But this. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Explanation. No way. That's pretty good. It's basically from Wikipedia. Traverse uh, my documents folder and find a file that contains two consecutive A's in the name. Okay. Damn. Pretty good. Jason. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I mean, that's kind of useful. Recursively. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> now it's just comment mode again. No. No, but it uses a different method. Mm -hmm. Now you have grab it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh, it's just in. in. Yep. I say add a button to the panel, which will add a customer to the database. On click event. So like there's no oh add oh, customer oh, yeah. the inner <laughs> HTML. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. After after ten customers have been added, delete all the customers. Okay. Well, <laughs> no, but delete customers works, but it also deletes the buttons. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, why don't we start again and let's have the notion of a, yeah. a data store. Customers, Customers and, and, and their products. Create a function that can add a customer to the data store. Well, well, that's, that's, I guess, real life. How do you do data store in JavaScript, right? Well, um, why don't you say create, create, a, create a customer's data structure? That's pretty good. Every customer has a name, a customer number, a unique customer number. And a location. That's pretty good. Now, um, create an array to store the customers in. Okay. And um, add a customer called John who lives in Sacramento. Quite impressed if it gets this. Wow. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Display the customers on the panel. Why don't we add the like a text box on the panel to add a new customer to the data store? Add a text box and a button to create a new customer. A form. Let's yeah. see whether it gets that. No way. Nice. That see? is pretty see? cool. See? Number three, location. This doesn't do anything yet. Was there an event? When a user click uh, submit. The form, yeah. add the list and, and update yeah. the list display. Yeah. <laughs> right. So press the add button? Yeah, I oh, added. Oh, you did, okay. It's definitely called. Oh no, there's an error. Okay. I don't even, <laughs> I don't even need to specify what the function does. Do you see this? On the right, it like already implements this function that pushes yeah. the new customer. That's crazy. This this submit thing is not called. So how about I can do this manually, I guess. Equals submit button event listener clip. Okay. So now Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Say um add a delete button for every customer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No way. Yeah. Look at that, look at that. It worked once, now it wow. doesn't work anymore. But... That is insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sick. It is pretty impressive in some mm. ways. I could see how this could be really good. Yeah. It's just, unfortunately, not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Something magic, you know, every now and then we've had a taste of, wow, that's really cool. But the reality is, it wouldn't save us any time. Now it just displays the location itself. That's what happened. So what do we do with the map of Great Britain? Okay, so now um, underneath the map, display the population of Great Britain. No, no, it doesn't. No, no it's, it's just, it's just uh, changing the inner HTML. Well, okay. it does set timeout, but this should yeah. be set to interval, interval now. Yeah. Now say... Yeah. Now say, um, alternate the color from blue to green every second. Well, the image color is, yeah. I mean, we need to have like CSS recolor or something. You'd say using a filter. Yeah, it's changed the no. color. 
But it's only done it once. How about this? Yep, 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 yep. When the player clicks the ball, it should fly towards the goal. This is doing some kind of calculation. <laughs> certainly. Certainly some stuff. <laughs> what the hell is it doing? Nothing much. Just a bunch of like computing some ball on click. Add gravity. The ball is affected by the gravity. But it goes to the right. <laughs> <laughs> well, see now, what if gravity goes to the left? No. Say, say the ball yeah. chases after the mouse cursor. The mouse enters the ball. It should start chasing. I mean, this is good, right? It has an on mouse uh, move event. Can we make a pendulum? Um, the square, like a pendulum. Oh, hello. We can. <laughs> we can. But it's not a pendulum that I'm. I want to have a circular pendulum pivot on an axis. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> this is brilliant. Act like a. We need to make a snooker game. A snooker. Okay. Add a background that is the table in full height and width. And green. Table is green. No, yeah, of course, stupid. Yeah. He actually made a table. Describe the ball in the abstract. Let's create, say six balls. Create a cloud for a ball that... And then say create six balls of random colours. And we want to make the balls um, round with a filter. Make the balls round. Let's just say round first. Oh, nope. No, no, no. Make. Oh, that looked quite good. Have we not got a balls array? Yeah, we do. Oh. So now this should add them to the balls, yes. No, actually they are here. They're just... Oh, okay. Each ball. Okay, brilliant. Right, so now um, we'll give them all a random velocity and when they intersect, they should bounce off each other. Balls collide, they should bounce off each other. Well, I don't know if that worked. Well, this is like a collision, no? Wow, okay. Damn. Okay, so this doesn't work when two balls collide. Look at that. Look at that. They turned red. Why don't we model a force of gravity okay. between all the pairs of balls? Is there something happening? I, th I thought so. I could detect something. When the balls intersect each other, one of them disappears. <laughs> That's great. Make a party. <laughs> well, a party is certainly taken literally. You can see that here we need to change this to let's say uh, 400x right and like 300 y because it's probably not good at that yeah see yeah. crazy go crazy <laughs> what does it do it speeds it up when they intersect the hole the ball disappears add a small black hole the ball is deleted and make the hole have a gravitational pull well the hole disappeared Interesting. Oh, and it bounces off. Yeah. You see? We did earlier, so it only affects new balls. It's basically GPT-3. Awesome. So, um, okay. Connor, what, what's your take on Codex? Unsurprising would be the one word I would use to describe it, I guess. It's definitely cool. Like, you know, just playing around with it. It's cool. It's fun. It's more visceral, I guess, for a lot of, uh, you know, engineering and software development type people to kind of have something that, you know, is in their domain, quote unquote. But ultimately it's not, it's kind of what I was predicting was going to happen. Even GPT-3, you know, who was not trained on code at all, had truly phenomenally terrible tokenizer for code. Like if you try to tokenize code, often it would tokenize every single white space in the indentation as its own token very often. So you'd have these ridiculous, you know, encodings of code. So it makes sense that there was a lot of like really low hanging fruit to have there. So I definitely think it's, in its current state, it's fun, it's interesting. Copilot seems genuinely useful to me. I'm not sure about, I mean, Codex is kind of like an, it's kind of like the basis for a product. 
Copilot is a product. Copilot is something you can use. It's like, uh, I haven't used it much myself yet, but everyone I've talked to who's used it said it's great for just doing the boring stuff that would have taken, you know, half of your day. And now you can do it, you know, 20% faster, which in itself is already really useful. Yeah. What about from a software engineering point of view? So when I was playing with Codex with, um, with Yannick, we were in the sandbox and it was really, really good when you were building things up from scratch and at first they even abstracted away the temperature parameter and all of that because you know i almost couldn't believe that we were talking to a gpt type model uh, it just magically produced the right code and it just seemed to work first time but how would it be different in a software engineering context so i mean obviously you have to know the limits of these models what they were what they were trained on what they're good at they're really really excellent at you know like basic boilerplate code using standard libraries it's, uh, you know, writing simple things that there's like clear examples of on the internet. So, you know, there's lots of examples for like little games uh, where, you know, walk on a 2D grid or something. There's lots of examples like that around the internet. So I'm not surprised that it's like really good at doing that specifically. The So from that perspective, the biggest use is that like, you know, a lot of programmers, of course, you know, rightfully or not uh, say that, you know, the most hardest part of programming is like, is not writing the boilerplate, which I agree with, obviously, you know. Often you have a huge code base with thousands of lines of code, but only like, you know, a hundred of them are like really difficult or like, you know, really important. And the rest is just connecting to a database and, you know, setting up your, your you know, type checking all your data or whatever. But even like, so I don't think this is going to lead to like a huge revolution, you know, uh, right now, at least of how we do software engineering or something. But even if you can, you know, if you're a big corporation, you know, you hire, you have 2000 software engineers and you can make them all 10% more efficient at writing boilerplate code. That's a big deal. Like that, that's the, I think that's the um, intended use case for stuff like Copilot. We shouldn't think it of like, okay, Copilot is going to, you know, is going to abstract away my star Haskell developer and his, you know, uh, genius programming. No, of course not. But, you know, your, your code monkeys that, you know, are writing, you know, JavaScript boilerplate or whatever. Um, if you even make them 10 to 20% more efficient, that's really good. Of course, the future, I think, is, you know, uh, things start um, kind of, you know, not so big yet. So far, things are still pretty modest. You know, okay, get 10% efficiency here. I, I like, you know, I don't want to speak about, you know, is this going to cost people jobs? I don't know, probably not, or at least not many. But the future, I think, is going to be different. I think Codex is kind of like one of the first signs of this. It's still a toy to a large degree, like, it, or at least these like playground things are like, oh, you know, you get a little thing to walk around a grid. That's cool, but, you know, it's not revolutionary. But I think in the future, as these models get better and better, you know, just kind of draw a straight line. At some point in the future, um, I can have a run, I can, you know, create an app or a startup or something just by talking to my computer. Like that, you know, I just give it natural language instructions. I want to create an app that does this and this, and it has this property or whatever, and the models will figure that out. I can't do that yet, but I think the, I, I think if you just extrapolate outwards, it's pretty obvious that it's coming. Interesting. Yeah, one of the things that Yannick and I did was um, we made a customer database. So we said, you know, I want to put a customer in the database and I want to have a form to add a customer in the database. And remarkably, it worked quite well, but the kind of code it produced was quite um, hacky. I mean, it was it was setting the inner HTML property, for example, on, on an HTML element. It's doing all the kind of stuff that, you, that you're normally not supposed to do. Uh, if we were doing it in real life, we would have some kind of enterprise framework or we'd use an MVC product or something. Or actually, if I was inside Google, they have their own custom end-to-end -end framework. They have their own kind of software engineering is all about modularization and finding a, a kind of information architecture to fit your problem. So that wouldn't necessarily exist in, uh, you know, Codex's memory bank. Yeah, absolutely. And like, as I said, like, I think you shouldn't think of Codex as replacing product managers, uh, but it's uh, as supplementing the people who, you know, the co uh, to the product manager manages. I don't think it's replacing them either. We're not there yet. As you said, you know, you, sometimes you have like, you know, specific demands on how the code is supposed to be structured or what libraries are used. It, but that those seem like solvable engineering challenges, you know, you know, companies could have, you know, bespoke models that are set up to understand the kind of coding style they use or the libraries they use. That all seems like, you know, like, so, sometimes I, I, I jokingly say that large models kind of feel like alien artifacts that kind of just drop from the sky one day and we're still banging rocks against them and trying to make them do something useful. And that's kind of how I feel about Codex. Codex obviously knows a lot of things about 
um, code. You know, of course, all the symbolists are going to come running and say it doesn't actually understand. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a philosophical point here. I'm trying to make like a practical point. Like you can, you, it obviously is capable of generating some useful things, and it's much better than all previous systems. And if this continues to extrapolate, which I think is a good null hypothesis to have, if it continues to improve, you know, just this is the very first time any product like this really has been built at this scale and this level of capabilities. If you just extrapolate that further, who knows how much performance, you know, we might get out of these things and how clever they might become and how useful they might become once we figure out that maybe natural language is the wrong way to interface with them. You know, maybe you write in the future, you write specs in some kind of domain specific language, and then these models figure out what you mean by that. And then maybe the domain specific language is not formal. So it's not like a, so like some, it's somewhere in between a formal language and natural language. Or like it's like nat it's like natural language, but but annotated with some kind of you know descriptive or whatever, and that gives the model enough hints that it can write like really good things. Or maybe you just write tests, and then using the tests, it will you know extrapolate what the code is supposed to look like. We're really just at the beginning of trying to understand you know what the correct way is to build systems using this kind of technology. Mm -hmm. Wally Tsubber actually was full of praise for the system. He couldn't believe that it worked so well on a diverse set of languages. I mean, admittedly, we edited the video, so he probably wasn't aware that 90% of the time we're fixing JavaScript errors and fixing problems. I think this is a problem, actually, with a lot of the examples of Codex Online, is it's so much more entertaining to show when it does work. But, Absolutely. Um, the key question, though, is um, to what extent is it just interpolating stuff that's seen on the internet now i know i know your answer to this right because i could go down the whole oh it's not doing any abstractive reasoning and your response is to say well actually it doesn't need to there's so much regularity out there in terms of the kind of code people write you can interpolate it is it is an information retrieval system but so what that that actually does exactly what we need it to do i mean i would argue that i have yet to see any convincing evidence that you know humans do something that is it very similar? Like, have you seen high school students do math problems? Have you seen like beginner programmers <laughs> program? It's not that clever. Sure, like some geniuses, you know, have done something for a very long time. They might figure out really, really clever things. But I think it's kind of an unfair comparison to co to compare literally the first system of this kind we've built and say, oh wow, why can't it invent its own dialect of Haskell? Man, this is such a weak system. Sure, I I, I think um like. Recently on Twitter, I, I re retweeted a funny thing where it's like, you know, those classic examples where you, you give people like a question where it's like four plus four times zero equals, and then like half the people I saw say that zero. One. Yeah, loads of people got it wrong. Yeah, Th there's this, there's a kind of implicit, like almost like status or like or like uh, reputable related implications of words like interpolation or it's just mm -hmm. memorization. That's the just does a lot of the heavy lifting here, in my opinion, is that I think sufficiently sophisticated interpolation or sufficiently sophisticated memorization is indistinguishable from intelligence. Hmm, interesting. Well, um, I'm trying to get to come up with a good example. So Jeff Hawkins spoke about um, Albert Einstein, for example. So the, the reason why he was able to solve or come up with this idea of general relativity was he could analogize it to everyday objects that we all understand. And then he could use that to communicate that understanding to other people. And then Jeff said, you know, when, when it came on to the, um, the, the, the field, um, equations, it, it was a completely different story. There weren't everyday objects to analogize it, but there does seem to be something that we can do with our reference frames, um, of understanding that allow us to traverse between different places and concept space in a way that you clearly can't do with a neural network. I don't say that's clear at all. GPT-3 can make some really great analogies. Go up. I mean, it's just like, you know, I, I've seen many people try this where it's just like, you give it examples like, you know, X is to Y like Z. And you just give it a bunch of examples like that. And some of them are pretty clever. All of them? Absolutely not. Again, have you listened to humans lately? Most people are not Einstein. And in many ways, you might argue maybe Einstein just, you know, got lucky. Like, you know, for every Einstein, we have kind of a survivorship bias. For every Einstein, there's 10,000 schizophrenics that think they've, you know, discovered the theory of everything and are completely dead wrong about everything and, you know, make like inferences about that. Like, I think 
there, there's a saying in, in engineering that um, often it's easier to understand how a system works when it's not working correctly. So I think it's really mm -hmm. interesting, actually, to look at like people that suffer from like mental illnesses or whatever, and how like, I don't know if you've ever like, you know, the classic, you know, online, you know, schizophrenic ramblings, and how much if it's like a model with a too high temperature parameter, or that it's making like weird analogies that don't actually work, or, or like, or like insists on like, using specific keywords like very heavily and then like draws analogies that just kind of seem completely out of control it's like again it's there's this question of um if something is sufficiently sophisticated that it can do everything a human does is there still a difference like you know if something uh, i'm not you know whether gpt models scale to human level intelligence is an open question i consider that an empirical question about science that we do not know the answer to the answer may be no that's absolutely possible it might be we hit a roll there's something there's something about how you know humans the algorithm works that's like fundamentally different from gradient descent and there's no possible way it can get there that's definitely possible but i think there is a lot of heavy lifting being done by words like just or clearly or obviously i don't think these things were obvious mm -hmm. at all it was not obvious like i feel like every person that says it's obvious that these things will not just scale should show that they predicted that gpt3 would work ahead of time if you predicted that neural networks would scale to precisely gpt3 performance and no further before gpt came out i i, I will I'll, I'll give you that but i think that most people wouldn't have predicted gpt3 ahead of time well, that's very interesting. I think you could argue that intelligence is multifaceted because I, I know you have a view of intelligence as being very kind of um, from a decision theory point of view. So in, in terms of making an optimal decision in any situation. And I think a lot of people invoking this analogy making as the core of cognition, it, it might be something which is very intrinsic uh, to humans. So it's a function of the topology of our brains and the function of our embodiment and how we interact with the physical world. So Albert Einstein, because of the way in which he learned the information and the order in which he learned the information, he had a certain topology in his brain and he can then traverse that topology. Maybe that's something that GPT-3 can't emulate, but maybe GPT-3 excels in another facet of intelligence that perhaps we don't. Yeah, that's where it's important to kind of dereference the pointer to intelligence. Intelligence is a word and it points to things. And one important thing about how humans use words is that we don't, uh, don't always point to the same things, even so we use the same words. Like some people, when they say intelligence, they mean like very specific things. They mean like symbolic reasoning or something. And that's a very specific thing that you can talk very specifically about. Other, most people point to like kind of like a vague intuition of like there's like agents and they have like they kind of like they kind of like have like thoughts and goals and can optimize sort of. Other people point towards you know like specific tests or whatever. So it's kind of important to de reference the pointer and kind of understand what are we talking about when we use the word intelligence. Someone kind of try to avoid using it when possible. So. I, ultimately, I think it's like it's, we should use our words as tools, is that when I use a, the word intelligence, what am I trying to accomplish with this? What am I trying to, what am I pointing to? Which concept do I care about of all possible things intelligence to refer to? What I personally care about is the ability to solve problems, is that obviously in our world, there are entities which we can pretty reliably point to as being intelligent and being able to solve certain problems. Like we can point to a rock and say, that's definitely not intelligent. And we can point to a human and say, yeah, that's definitely intelligent. And there's some things in between where like, like insects or like, you know, animals were like, eh, is that intelligent? Maybe kind of depends on how you point it. But there are like some clear examples and there are some things and there, there's, but there's many things that humans have that rocks don't and vice versa, you know, it's like, so the way I see it is what I care about is, is that um, the, the, these systems can solve problems that they can solve very hard problems that a rock can't solve. Like there are, there are situations where I want a rock, you know, I'm building a wall. I want a rock to just sit there. I don't want it to, you know, spontaneously have goals and start walking away. Um, there are other situations where I want to hire somebody and I don't want to hire a rock. I want to hire someone who, you know, can do the job and solve the problems I can have. And then there, so that's kind of the meta discussion. Then you have the, in, the discussion of like, okay, but what is the thing? What is the, the thing? Is it symbolic reasoning? Is it some kind of specific algorithm? Is it a class of algorithms? And I don't know, obviously. I don't know how the brain works. And I don't know how unique the brain is in how it works. There might be, you know, there might be, you know, many ways to skin a cat. There might be many ways to achieve performance, but, you know, may have a very alien architecture. And like, like if an alien came to us from the, you know, and from a seventh dimensional, you know, universe, and it looks at the world around, and it's completely incapable of functioning. Like, it's like, where are the other dimensions? I cannot function. And it's just completely stupid. It falls over and dies. 
is that thing intelligent or not? In our universe, it just falls over and dies. But in its universe, maybe it was the Einstein of its universe that figured out the seven dimensional you know, equations. So it's not super simple to define intelligence in that way. So I try to focus more on the practical aspect is like these models in some sense have become much better at things that we would traditionally associate with intelligence. 10 years ago, you know, we could barely understand a picture, barely play Go, you no, know, barely do any of these things. Nothing like GPT-3, nothing like Codex. All of this was very far away. I think there is some sense in which these models have become more powerful. Can I formalize that? Not really. But I'm not sure of that, how important that really is. Interesting. No, you, you're so right, though. I think when, when we um, invoke the word intelligence, straight away, we, we have a very anthropocentric conception. And also, uh, if you've been listening to J. Mark Bishop, his Dancing with Pixies Reductio, he, he has this thought experiment that even a rock has an infinitude of conscious experiences, but that's far too philosophical for now. Anyway, O'Connor, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Pleasure as always. So just like a bank job, um, Dr. Kilcher, what's your take on Codex? Um, I don't think it's ready yet for what they advertise it as. Uh, so my experience, I guess our experience was that you probably still need to be able to code to make use of this tool at all, because it can produce code, but you have to read it. You have to make sure what it wrote is correct. And you have to, uh, know how to edit the code if something's not right. In addition to that, if it doesn't do what you want, you often have to reformulate yourself. Um, so for example, if it's like check if two balls intersect, when you have like a, a game where two ball, like balls fly around, it would sometimes just check once, like right now, do two balls intersect? Then you have to reformulate, like uh, make or continuously check whether two balls intersect or create a function that checks whether two balls intersect and then continuously run that function. So you have to uh, almost like be a programmer uh, in order to interact with this system properly. So there are some things that it's, I feel it's uh, very bad at, <laughs> namely like lead code algorithm questions. I, I don't think it's like, it's a, it's, it's a, quite a ways away from that. Uh, you know, give me for two lists, give me the elements that is larger than the blah, 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 and the mean of the blah, blah, blah. No. Um, however, there are things that it's really good at, namely almost like the boring things of coding. So create all SQL statements for a particular data model. It's we've, we've seen it be like extremely competent at that, right? You give it the data model, right? You say, I have a customer, it has a, a name and, 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 and sort of a basket of items. And then the, the items are products and they're in stock and whatnot. And it would even understand the foreign key relations and all it would just create your SQL statements for you. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's pretty beautiful. And those are the parts of coding that no one wants to do, like 90% of Java code can probably be just automated because <laughs> you don't have to write the stupid getters and setters and, and, and whatnot. Right. So that, that kind of stuff, I think it's really good at also in, in web programming, when mm. you, you know, you want to, you want to like do a form that has some fields, uh, even with the best libraries nowadays, it's still kind of a pain. So that kind of stuff i totally see it it being applied to do you believe though that there is a lot of regularity to reality because connor said basically that everything you'd ever want to do you know in intelligence basically isn't as smart as we think it is it's all out there and if you interpolate over it then you can do everything you need to do but i know that you work in a legal startup and that's a great example. I think it's quite instructive because we would love to automate the legal profession. I mean, God, they're almost as annoying as accountants, but you can't do it, right? Because every situation is novel. And similarly, when I need to write a piece of code, it doesn't necessarily look like things that are out there. It, it, it always seems novel. Well, the legal profession in particular is special because it requires judgment. 
right? A, a lot of legal people think of the law as this sort of algorithmic thing that you can do, but it's very often it's not that. Very often the law contains language of judgment, of reasonableness, of uh, just 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 sort of you have to live in the actual world in our time in order to make sense of the law, which you can't a you, an algorithm you can't expect an algorithm to to be able to do that it can maybe sort of replicate some stuff but not particularly much when it comes to coding though you know a lot of people code <laughs> by going to stack overflow and, and sort of mishmashing together code and i'm pretty sure you can get codex to a level where you can achieve the same thing uh, where you as a human essentially act sort of as a selection machine for what Codex produces. And if they make it a little bit more user-friendly in that it can not only produce code, but it can maybe refactor, or you can say, look, here are three pieces that I have from Stack Overflow. Please put them together, <laughs> make them go together. Um, I think something like this is certainly, certainly doable. Yeah. I don't know whether many people know this, but I'm also building a startup around a software code review as a service. And it'd be quite cool if rather than generating the code, you could use it to um, scrutinize the code. Because I guess, mm -hmm. you know, from a software engineering point of view, you can't trust generated code, right? Because it's it's probably full of security holes. So at some point, either a human or an algorithm needs to check it. Well... I don't know. It depends on how it was generated, right? Like for a lot of stuff, I'd rather have generated code than like, you know, I'd rather have my compiler write assembly than a human. So it, like it, it depends on what, what's, you know, what the task is and how confident you are in, in the machine. And I, I think this might be the same as with self-driving cars. There might be tasks in which these machines perform again and again and again and again, just so flawlessly that with time, you just accept that they make less mistakes than humans, just empirically, right? And they're yeah. going to screw up every now and then, but so does a human, right? In fairness as well, a large class of um, error modes are laziness. It's because the humans probably knew how to use that design pattern, or they probably knew they should have checked that um, that security key into the, uh, you know, they should have put it in a config file. They shouldn't have checked it into the repo, but they just couldn't be bothered. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it's, I, I don't, I don't think there's, there's too much of a, of a clear cut right here. I think that the state that codex is in is not yet ready for pretty much anyone to, to use right now. Um, the examples are kind of cherry picked and but I see the potential, like there's there's clearly a potential there, uh, not too far away for something like this to be quite useful, be it for generating or as you say, just analyzing a piece of code and just red flagging all the weird things. Even Walid Sabah was impressed. That That is, wow, I've not seen that yet. I know, I'm fairly sure that OpenAI will get even more investment now that Walid Sabah is just given it the <laughs> <laughs> awesome um dr kilcher thank you very much thank you lovely dr suburb we've been playing around with codex um what's your take on it does it just remind you of gpt3 very much so i mean it's uh essentially it's the same for the lack of a better word same paradigm basically it obviously uh it has digested millions of lines of snippets of code from all over. It, impressive that it covers many paradigms and, and platforms and from SQL to Python to Java code classes and objects. So very impressive. Uh, and uh, I guess that's the magic of uh, connecting OpenAI with Microsoft. Now they got GitHub which obviously means they got billions of lines of code uh, from, I was like uh, in a few places going like, wow, 
Look there, this is cool, right? So impressive. Uh, would it would it really finish the job? No. Can can someone actually use it? That's a big question. I don't know. Probably. Uh, it reminds me of uh, the old uh, case, computer aided software engineering, where you also had drag and drop, and the classes were generated for you. I mean, you had some really nice tools. Uh, but uh, it impressed me more than the GPT-3 on the language side. Because on the language side, I, uh, you, you're matching language to language. I mean, here you're matching language to code. It's, it's very, very like, wow. I mean, uh, you, it seems like you're programming a natural language. It, it's, it's just, uh, uh, very cool to see. I, I really commend them on this one. This is very impressive. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I know you might be surprised with this reaction, but you gotta give the guys credit. This is, this is an amazing, uh, accomplishment. I mean, uh, very impressive. I'm, I'm, su I'm surprised. You can easily. I'm surprised yeah. that you would be so positive. About, yeah. Because I, I, if I, anything, my position is exactly the same as GPT-3. Um, I think it's very right, impressive. Right. It's, it's an information it, retrieval system, right? And it's very impressive when right, right. you are typing something in like for like as it exists on the internet. I put a leak code question in there, which wasn't publicly available, and it was useless. It didn't do anything. Right, right. I mean, you can easily trip it. I mean, obviously, if you if you write uh, if you ask for a novel algorithm or a novel function, this thing is not writing code. Let's let's be clear. Like like the GPT three is not really generating code and code new text but the stitching of stuff that it saw in different places together is really impressive i mean it it it, it doesn't add apples and oranges it really adds apples with apples that's the impressive part so uh tech wise technology wise we know what's happening this thing has seen billions of lines of code and but the matching is impressive if you dig deep into the technology you're going to be disappointed but it, it looks impressive i i was like you know there were moments where i was like wow what the hell right it's yeah. uh but i doubt it will i i doubt that if you ask for a novel function that even if someone wrote it somewhere but some exotic function that we need every day it's not going to generate code. This thing does not generate code. As long as they sell it the right way and they don't, you know, embellish things beyond, uh, uh, because I saw stuff online that's really ridiculous. I mean, uh, AI can now write code on its own. No, yeah. don't say stuff well, like I think that. that this is it. There's cognitive dissonance because as an information retrieval system, I think it's to their credit. But as an AI system, something that can reason abstractly and generalize from a small amount of information to something completely different it's not even knocking on the door of that right. like yeah. the, the the interesting thing is as you said the amount of regularity there is in the world we live in um, most of the functions people right. want to write are the same there's surprisingly little novelty right. Right. but just like with tesla's self-driving right. cars when you're driving out in the country and a horse goes in front of your car or a parade of ducks right these are edge cases and maybe in the right. coding scenario it doesn't matter right well look i mean it's the old uh, 80 20 percent but but uh, in 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 something like automatic programming it's that 20 percent that i i want i mean it, the 80 percent is now with our ides and with our uh, frameworks and is already there. I mean, like, what's the difference dragging a table in, in a .NET? Uh, I mean, you can also create a, a huge database by uh, dragging tables and making uh, so, or, or saying create a table in text. Probably visual, it's even easier. So it's, it's writing, it's coming up with solutions for me that I like, gee, how do you write a function like this? No. 
if if that's what you're looking for and no forget it there's no intuitive creativity at all this is fetching this is a massive information retrieval an impressive massive information retrieval yeah. machine in this case the information is code uh but because of the scale and because of the sheer size of this thing it's impressive it looks like you know uh, i can get you code relevant to what you're asking and because it's language to code it, it looks flashy. It looks like, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a command in English and out comes code. So, it, but th there's very little that is relevant to AI here. Let's be clear. I mean, it's, uh, this is an IR machine and in this case code, and it's not actually new. People thought about uh, doing uh, information retrieval on massive class libraries back in the days when OO was and they thought of writing business objects that can cover pretty much everything and they tried to come up with standards and and then all you do in the end is retrieve the relevant object and use it and there you go obviously re uh, real life didn't work out like that but so this is uh, an information retrieval for relevant snippets of code but yeah on on the ai side uh, automatic programming is still a dream. Yeah, exactly. So just the, the closing thought. Um, I, I couldn't use this myself. I, I don't think it would it would save me any time. It's only really useful in the from, from scratch uh, regime, right? So you, you start with a blank slate. It produces some code for you. Right. To use this thing incrementally on an existing code base in the context of a software engineering lifecycle, can't really see that happening. But yeah, it's it's like the old IDE where you can you can generate the skeleton of something in you know in few clicks and dra drag and drop, and then you have some code generated, just a basic skeleton, an empty shell. So this yeah, this will help you. Uh, look, it will be also useful. I can see it useful to someone who's not quite the experienced programmer that. Uh, probably uh, others, uh, I mean, they, they, it will help them to see how things look like underneath. So, you know, you, you uh, especially in, you, in building a UI, let's say, oh, then there should be an, uh, 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 there should be an event for the button. So, okay, it, it will, basically it's showing them sample code. It's, it's cool, you know, it's like uh, if you're a beginner, and you try something unique that you never tried before this thing will give you sample code <laughs> right so then oh you say ah i need i need an event here to capture the okay uh in that sense it's cool it it it, it has some places where it can be used i, I can see it in um, in training or even in high school programming uh, courses like oh look guys this is what a tape this is how you create a table so let's say we want to create a table uh, for a customer with name, age. Okay, you see how it happens? The the attributes are s slotted this way. So it's uh, it's a nice uh, way to see sample code. Awesome. Uh, I, I can imagine several uses for it. I hey folks, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Sorry for the delay on the Jeff Hawkins episode. I promise I'll release it on Friday. Uh, it's just taking a very long time for us to produce that episode. Peace out.